Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, the master, the king, the, the wonder of all of our hearts, our savior, our healer, our king, our present reigning, ruling sovereign, how we love you today. We will love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love our neighbor as ourselves, O oh God. We will forgive those, Lord God, who scandalize us and, and offend us. We will give them forgiveness, Lord God. And we will stand uh, in that place with Christ. Being in a position where we have been justified by faith alone through Christ alone. Thanking you for this imputed righteousness. We are righteous because of your finished work, your substitutionary work for us on the cross. And right now, Lord God, you are growing us and you are teaching us your word one step after the next. And I ask, Lord, that that would continue in the lives of each of these people, each of these glorious citizens of the kingdom today. And strengthen each one of them, Lord God, with all might by your spirit in their inner man, that Christ dwells in their hearts by faith, that they are rooted and grounded in love, knowing what is the hope of their calling, the riches of their inheritance as saints, and the exceeding greatness of the power that each one of them have who believe that power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead. It dwells in us, O oh Lord. It lives in us. It enables us, Lord God, to be victorious and overcome one challenge after the next, after the next, after the next. It is true, O oh Father, that your grace is sufficient for us, that your power is made perfect in our weakness. And so we bless you today, Lord, and that the word have free course and be glorified amongst each of my brothers and sisters today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, Pursue love, <coughs> yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands. But in his spirit he speaks mysteries, but... One who prophesies speaks to men for edification, exhortation, consolation. One who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. But one who prophesies edifies the church. Now I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you would prophesy. And greater is one who prophesies than one who speaks in tongues unless he interprets so that the church may receive edifying. Now, how many of you took note of the fact that there is a singular and a plural for tongue, tongues that's going on throughout this? Because I've been bringing your attention to that very, very good, okay? You need to mark that. You need to be aware of that. You don't have to go back through it right now. But as we roll through this, I will bring this to your attention because this is Paul's terminology relative to two different times uh, two different kinds of, of exhibitionism that is going on right here. One is holy. One is God's work. One is a work of one of the revelation gifts that when the revelation gifts occurred, it was absolutely understood and uh, astounding. Nobody misunderstood it. <coughs> These gifts were self-explanatory. In other words, they were like an explosion, if you know what I'm saying. But in the Corinthian church, a little bit of review here now. Remember, we got a lot of flesh peddling going on right here. We got folks especially who are really even involved with the demonic because they have come out of the various type of of, uh, of religions, the Cybel religions, and Athenia, the worship of, the, of Athenia, and others we've talked about in the past. When Paul starts using the word mysteries, for instance, bottom of verse 2, there's a man who speaks in a tongue, and he speaks mysteries. This is terminology relative to the Cybel religion, things that were hidden that could only be understood when you were in a trance-like state, like in the whirling dervish kind of a thing, and you babbled in this tongue. Now remember, a tongue singular 
a tongue singular does not define any understanding because one kind of a tongue is just a tongue. It's a babble. But when you get into the New Testament, you always got the plural going on. On the day of Pentecost, they spoke in other what? Tongues. Yeah, tongues, okay? And they were understood, remember? Remember what the testimony is? How is it that we hear them speaking in our own languages? Parthians, Medes, dwellers in Mes Mesopotamia, Rome, and he goes on like that. All of them had their own dialectos, had their own language that they could understand. Uh, on the other hand, you got these folks in Corinth who are from a whole different world right here. And they were involved with these mystery religions. Well, some of them were involved in making up the language themselves. Here's where the gift of discerning of spirits comes in, which we've already dealt with in the 12th chapter, haven't we? Okay. So discerning of spirits, is it God's spirit that's going on right here in the case of the tongue being spoken? Is it God's spirit? Is it man's spirit? Or is it a demonic spirit? Which now brings us to what? The fact that chapter 8 introduces idolatry wherein these people thought that these things were actually gods. And Paul denies that they were actually gods. However, he does start to speak about the fact that behind each one of these symbols, these idols, there was a spirit controlling the aspects. Then we get into chapter 10, uh, about verse 22, 23, in that area right there. And Paul has to start talking about the fact that there are some individuals who are involved in the demonic, but not every, be not every person who is a true believer, regenerated, born again. <coughs> Just ignore the, the coughing. Anybody who's born again cannot have fellowship with a demon. Can't do it. Can't have it. He even uses the Greek words that talk about pino, taking one inside. He says, you cannot take within you a demonic spirit if you're a believer. But that's the linchpin right there. Not every one of them were believers. We've already seen that because of the amount of sin and flesh that has been commented on by Paul from chapter 1 clear through to where we are at right now. And then remember the beginning of chapter 12. Chapter 12, where he talks about the fact that I don't want you to be ignorant about the spirituals. And then he talks about somebody or some several people who are in the congregation who are saying out loud, Jesus, anathema, isu anathema, Jesus is cursed. And then they're actually having to ask Paul, can somebody in the congregation actually curse Christ, you know, in the ideas, and be a Christian? Well, Paul's saying, no, that's not the case. And then he comes right back to the idol idea again, and he says, this is the background to all of this. So what we've got in Corinth is we've got demonic activity that is taking place here, and it has everything to do with these gifts. Notice also that throughout all of uh, the, uh, the epistles in the New Testament, out of all of that, all of that, there's no mention of any of these gifts relative to trouble going on. He doesn't have to give all of this detailed teaching relative to the gifts because the, it, they weren't issues. Now, I don't want to come from an argument of silence here because, as we know, an argument from silence leads to nothing but silence. It, it doesn't prove anything, okay? But the fact is he's not dealing with any of this stuff. But here at Corinth, it's a whole other matter because it's the demonic culture that is a part uh, of, of this scenario at, at Corinth that is now coming into the church. People are either curious or they're coming in thinking, well, this is a new God, you know, a new religion, let's go check it out, you know, kind of. Or you've got people, you know, who were um, uh, responding to the gospel in some way <coughs> and uh, they end up being false professors. On the other hand, you have true believers there as well, and Paul talks about all of that. So the, all of that is necessary to remember as we get into 
this 14th chapter. So, let's dig in. 14th chapter is, is divided up amongst two main subjects. It's the subject of the difference between tongues, the true languages, various languages that God gave at that time, and the false tongue, singular, which is just Babel, and the subject of prophecy. The subject of prophecy. And as we go through this chapter, notice I said we are going through this chapter, I'll be back. Okay. And as we go through this chapter, we're going to see some very interesting little tests that Paul wants to put the Corinthians through, especially in regards to discerning true prophets from false prophets, okay? And uh, we'll have more to say in regards to that back then. But notice how he opens this up now, chapter 14 and verse 1. He says, pursue love, yet desire earnestly. Uh, spiritual gifts. I like the fact that what's happening here is basically he's carrying on from the end of chapter 13. Look at verse 13 in chapter 13. Verse 13, chapter 13. But now faith, hope, love, abide these three. Abide these three within your assembly. But the greatest of these is love. So pursue love. Now it's diokete in Greek for pursue. Diokete. You can also use this word as a word of persecution. Now the context will tell you how to do it. So obviously this is not a persecutorial type of scenario right here. So we're going to go with the alternate readings, which means to chase something down. Pursue is good. I kind of like that idea. But it's the idea of relentless chasing something down. If the greatest of these things is love, and when he ends it, uh, chapter 13 and verse 13, he's, he's bringing together the idea of the use and abuse of the gifts. But when the gifts are used, he says, and in chapter 13, he speaks about the five revelation gifts that would cease. They would end of themselves or they would be deactivated. Uh, tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy, word of wisdom, word of knowledge would come to a close once perfect or complete revelation comes, comes about. And we've already been through all of this, and I've got some YouTube videos I recommend that I've done in regards to, to this teaching, so I'm, I don't want to go repeat everything right now. But what powers, what is the engine of all of these gifts? And what about the gifts that are still happening? Miracles is not said to have gone or would go away. Discernment of spirits is not said to have gone or would go away. And, and, and these other gifts as healings, the gifts of healings, it's just not denied. So I'm not going to deny something that the Bible itself does not deny. I will affirm what the Bible says, right? We believe what the scriptures say, but we don't. We don't take something and turn it into something we just want it to say. Uh, that's disingenuous, and we don't, we don't do that. So what powers the, these gifts? Well, love does. So that's now, now he says, I want to talk to you about prophesying, and I want to talk to you about tongue and tongues, and make this correction. Why? So that we have health in the body, because at this time, tongues, the true gift, prophesying the true revelation gift still active uh, in the church at this time because the perfect revelation had not yet come. It was in process is what it was doing. So he says in verse 1, now pursue that love. Chase that love down. Yet, he goes on to say in verse 1, desire earnestly spiritual gifts. So you have to chase the love down but your heart's desire, your zelote, uh, it's the second person uh, uh, plural right here because he's, he's including all of the believers there. Be zealous about a certain something. And that's what? The spirituals. Now it says spiritual gifts here in our English, uh, New American Standard, but the Greek is tanumatica. 
tanumatica. Notice that your translation leaves out the definite article in front of spiritual. It really shouldn't do that. It should be the spirituals. Now what did Paul introduce the spiritual gifts as in chapter 12 verse 1? He says, brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant about the spirituals. Again, in the Greek, it's tanumatica. I don't want you to be ignorant about the spirit. That's Paul's phrase for the spiritual gifts. He doesn't even really call it gifts right here. It's the spirituals. And that's fabulous right there because you got a supreme title for what these things truly are. They're not physical. They're not manifested relative to, uh, to the flesh. They can't be made up. They are truly the spirituals. But let's keep moving. He wants them to earnestly desire the spirituals. But now there's one spiritual that really stands out amongst all the other spirituals. Now, now he says it's prophecy. So look at the bottom of verse 1. But especially... Especially, malista in Greek. It stands out amongst everything else. Stands out amongst everything else. But especially, that you may prophesy. Ah, prophesy. Why? Why is that so important? Why does that seem to be the malista? Why does that stand out more than anything else? Why prophecy? Now, I've talked to you about this before. We've already done chapter 12. I've gone through the dips, different types of prophecy. Prophesying, in a sense today, is still happening because every time you read God's word, this is prophecy. This is prophecy. When you read God's word privately, there is prophesying going on. It's one of the... It's one of the private spirituals, if you will, and I won't take it any further than that because then I start talking about things that sound good to me and I don't think that's right. So, so there is a private prophesying. There's a public prophesying. Tell me we read the scriptures today. Shh, darn right we did. Okay, there's prophesying right there. When, uh, when uh, one, of, one of the elders here gets up and preaches, this is a proclamation, but it's prophesying. Because prof to prophet uh, is to declare. It's to declare. Um, uh, we haven't discussed uh, what the nature of this declaration is yet. The nature of the declaration could be one of the, or tanumatica, could be one of the spirituals. It could be one of the, one of the revelation level spirituals. Or it could just be speaking forth God's word authoritatively. But in any case, he says, this has got to stand out. Okay, why does this have to stand out? Why especially this? Look back at chapter 12 and look at verse 7 with me. Chapter 12 and verse 7. Now this is the linchpin verse that everything, every use of the, of the tanumatica uh, depends upon. He says, but to each one, each individual, is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. I just love those words, to each one. So you've got one. Is given, it's a gift of grace, the manifestation. So it's going to manifest. It's going to show itself. Whether, it, uh, uh, you know, any of the gifts, including the, the seven in Romans chapter 12, um, the four, uh, which is a, a, a collection of leadership uh, gifts for the most part. Uh, in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, there's two in First Peter, uh, the fourth chapter. But, but they're going to be manifested. But, but what is its use? To make me look good? Look how spiritual I am? Is that it? It's for the common good. It's for the good of everybody else. So, so when somebody, uh, look, listen, listen to me, okay? There's, there's, a, there's a manifestation of love when people sign up to clean our church. It's a manifestation of love. It shows itself. Okay? On the other hand, it's a manifestation when somebody says, uh, let's say the elders recognize somebody as, as God is working, you know, that call and that gift uh, of, of the diaconate within them, right? We have one deacon, I expect, 
for the Lord to manifest, you know, other deacons. And that person responds to that and, and follows after the declarations relative um, to all that should be considered in regards to what makes up a deacon and how that deacon manifests. And when that person says, yes, there's a manifestation of that work that goes on right there, you know, and I according to scripture. So it's manifesting. But it's for the common good. It's for everybody else. See, What's the problem with the Corinthians? I want to look good. I want to be the center. They love prophesying. They love speaking in other babbles. Didn't matter if it was the real deal, tongues, plural, or the false, tongues, singular. But they love that stuff. Those were the two main things that were going on in Corinth. Tongues is probably the least of all the revelation gifts because in order to understand what is being manifested, you got to have a what? Good, good. Got to have an interpreter. So it's already weak. It's already weak. Plus, in tw chapter 12, uh, verse 28 and 29, he says, not everybody has tongues. Not everybody gets it. Not everybody gets the true gift. But there's a whole bunch of people here in chapter 14 that have got the tongue, that have got the babble going on. All right, so just wanted you to see that. 12.7 is for the common good. You look back at 14.1, especially that you might prophesy. Now we're talking about a gift <coughs> which he is going to define as to usefulness uh, in verse 3, but we're not there yet. So especially that you might prophesy. So he sets prophesying up. Doesn't require any kind of interpretation or anything like that. It's a direct revelation from God unless he says it's, it's otherwise in the text. If it's a direct revelation from God, then when it comes on the scene, when somebody truly prophesied in the right way according to scriptural dictation, there was no question as to what this was. There was no question. People would look to one another and say, God, you think that was the Lord, Larry? Do you think that was the Lord? Man, I'm not sure. You know, it wasn't any of that kind of stuff going on. And guess what else? The laws relative to conduct of the prophet being absolutely having to be 100% right every time as it is established in Deuteronomy 13 and Deuteronomy 18 were uppermost in everybody's mind. And that criteria has never changed. There's a death penalty if you make a mistake. There's a death penalty if you make a mistake. In Pentecostal and Charismatic realms today, they got a whole teaching right now about a charismatic uh, prophesying where, you know, it's okay to make a mistake. It's okay. We're learning. This kind of a thing. No, 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 no. And I'm not, you know what, I'm, I'm not suggesting let's go out and I'm not saying anything like that, but God's, God's attitude and his establishment should cause us to pause here in regards to this. Really? Have you not read Jeremiah the, where you're taking God's name and his word in your mouth? Really? This doesn't scare you? It should scare every person, especially you claim to be a prophet, oh my gosh, but every pastor, every teaching elder, it should cause us to uh, uh, pull back in fear. What did Isaiah say near the end of Isaiah? He said, I'm looking for people who tremble at my word. Verse 2. <laughs> for one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. Notice the shift. We move from prophesying to a tongue. He says especially, especially prophesy, because that's for the common good, for everybody else, for guess what? They were not especially promoting prophesying. They were especially promoting not tongues, but a tongue. So he goes right to that, because that is the opposite of what prophesying is. For one who speaks in a tongue, that's a babble, right? One who speaks in Babel does not speak to men. Stop! Stop! <laughs> I mean, good night. All right, there's the problem right there. Does that not contradict 12.7? Yep. 
Sure, the manifestation of the Spirit is for the common good, is for the benefit of everybody else. But he just said, one who babbles, one who babbles does not speak to men. Well, that, then it's out. It's, 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 uh, uh, it's self-deprecating is what it really is. It says it for what it is. So they're not speaking to men. Now the next three words, but to God. You with me with this? But to God. All right, let's, let's concentrate on this just for a second. Keep in mind what I've talked to you in regards to the text talking to us about the demonic enterprise that was involved in Corinth, the people that would come out of these Athenian uh, various mystery religions, and they spoke mysteries amongst themselves. We'll get to that a little bit more in just a second. One who speaks in a Babel, which is what was taking place um, in uh, the Cybel religions and things like that, they would speak just in this Babel. I've even given you a demonstration on a couple of occasions. Jen enjoyed that. You know, I can just pull this stuff out because of my background. Can you pull that out, brother? Can you? I'm asking if you can pull that tongue thing out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fred, Fred Frillstone or something like that. Yeah, Brian and Lenady, I bet you can still do it, can't you? Yeah, yeah it's easy. And the thing is, is that um, once you're out and once you're taught, the fear thing goes away because they really, they really promote the fear thing about you know don't you don't you make fun of that kind of you're blaspheming God. Really, I want you to show me here, and of course they can't. All right, but but now watch this. One who speaks in a babble. Is not speaking to men, all right? Then they're out because that's contradictory 12 7. But they're speaking to who? All right. The text has the Greek word, this is the Greek for God, theo, right there. Theo. It is minus, minus the definite article. Right. It's not to theo. We're minus the definite article. Okay, what, what difference does that make? Well, the definite article defines who we are really talking about here. But this is very simple. If we're talking about the one true living God, if we're talking about Yahweh, if we're talking about uh, 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 the mighty God El Shaddai, if we're talking about Yahweh, then there needs to be a definite article in front. So there's no mistaking this. So it's missing a definite article. So it's not talking about the true God. Now there were many gods in Corinth because of the many religions that were going on. And this Babel came out of where? It came over, transferred over, out of these various mystery religions and came into the church of Corinth. Very simple. I mean, it's very simple to think about right here. It's like, it's like, oh yeah, I got that. Oh, I can do that, you know. I can join into this. Feel very much at home right there. And so there was this mistake going on. Keep in mind that there's something else you have to keep in, uh, uh, uppermost in our mind about this church at Corinth. There's a complete absence of any pastoral oversight. There's no elders talked about here. Once again, argument from silence, I know. But oh my gosh, this is concerning. Now you go to the 16th chapter, you got the household of Stephanus happening right there. And Paul is, is acknowledging that they have some kind, I don't know, I want to call it maybe oversight. And he's encouraging the people to listen to them. But at no point does he give them um, the understanding that this is, that these are pastors or there's eldership uh, authority going on right there. If there was, certainly he would. Okay, but that's as far as we can go with that. So where's the teaching? Where's the authority? Where's the oversight? Where is the rebuke? Well, it's not here. It's not here. So we're stuck with, he says, this individual who speaks in a tongue, a babble. He's not speaking to men, but to God. No definite article. One God, in my opinion, this is one God among many gods. For, for, watch this. No one understands, but, if you've got a New American Standard, scratch out the word in. If you've got a New American Standard, scratch out the word his. These are additions. No one understands. 
All right, now wait a minute. If nobody's understanding, that helps us to understand that the one who is babbling is not babbling in a true language. This is not something that can be interpreted. And this is all going to come up uh, in this context right here. It's all going to come up in tests that Paul wants to give them. And they're, they're self um, they're self-provable tests, if you will, that will show that these things are not really from God. For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to, we could even say it's a narthris. You could even say a God, for that matter. A God. For no one understands, but spirit, he speaks mysteries. Now, it's okay to understand that, well, it's it's. It, what, it, what does that mean? Spirit, he speaks mysteries. Well, it's either by or in spirit, he speaks mysteries. And that's why they've added, but in his spirit, he speaks mysteries. All right, so this activity, listen now, this activity of false religiosity and, religiosity and the manifestation of this false religiosity is taking place within this person, within this person, who is not speaking to the one true God. Now, Pentecostals and Charismatics have used this verse for a long, long time to justify that there is some sort of a private prayer college, you know, uh, prayer, prayer room sort of language, private language between you and God, kind of like, well, it says it right here, you know, but it doesn't speak in a tongue, speak in a, but they don't understand the singular tongue. They have, they have not understood the background to, to Corinth and everything else that's a part. You cannot separate chapter 14 from the rest of this book. See, this is the problem. We leave context, and context sometimes can be immediate. It can be the entire book. Carrie and I are restudying Romans right now at the house, and I mean, you got to have, we're in, uh, uh, did we come to the end of chapter 8? Yeah, we need to go back over that again. But, but, but people so often will separate, like for instance, Romans 8.1. You all know it. There is therefore now no condemnation, though there's in Christ. Listen, listen, listen. If you don't place chapter 7 right immediately behind that, you will not understand why there is no condemnation, because he just got through saying, guess what's inside of you? Well, there's this principle of sin or this law of sin that's inside of you. And here's the idea. But even though that's inside of you, there is no condemnation. See? That's the, that, that's the amen right there. That's, that's, that's the important part, all right? But here, oh my gosh. He says, in his spirit, he speaks mysteries. He's speaking in regards to the, the mystery that is brought on by the tongue that is being spoken to this God which no man can understand. And so it's a mystery. Now let me ask you, having, having said all that, can this mystery, these mysteries, be anything like, for instance, when Paul talks about the mystery of Christ in Ephesians or Colossians, can it be anything like that? Absolutely not, because you've got tongue, no man understands him, he's talking to a God. Of course not. That's contextual interpretation. But see, notice how much time you have to take, you know, with people to get them to understand that. If I'm sitting down with somebody, you're sitting down with somebody, you know, pray that the Holy Spirit will give time uh, and that that person will be patient with you. Well, why are we talking about this? Because it's like we're a reformed congregation and, and uh, we know that this stuff has been used and now it's set aside. The perfect revelation has come. So why do we really need to spend time with this? Because we love our brothers and sisters in Christ because they are wayward, because we are responsible for them, 
because a Bible doctrine church is an evangelizing church. You, you got to do the work of the evangelist. Like Paul told Timothy, you, if you're strong doctrinally, you're responsible to bring that doctrine and to help your brothers and sisters in this regards. Because you got to pursue love, baby. It's all motivated by love. We're going to have folks come into the church, you know, who they're Arminian. <clears throat> We're going to jump them or something like that. Well, I don't know. Some of you might. <laughs> We're going to have folks that are going to come in and they're, they're still holding on to the charismata, you know. Easy. Take it easy, you know. Get to know them. Friends. Conversations. Why do you think they're there? This is not some, you know, possible happening or something like that. I mean, this is the Holy Spirit directing. Uh, in this way. Now he switches from tongue. Notice verse 1 is about prophesying. That's the, that's the primary gift. Especially that you might prophesy. But then there's this problem. There is this, there is this uh, abuse uh, uh, sort of manifestation called a tongue that sticks its head in in verse 2. Now we get to verse 3. We're doing good. Now we get to verse 3 and now we get a definition back to prophesying. Okay, and notice how this is up against the tongue, all right? Verse 3, but one who prophesies speaks to men for, and he names three things, edification, exhortation, consolation. King James says comfort. I kind of like that better, actually. One who prophesies speaks to men for edification, exhortation, and comfort. Can somebody who speaks in a tongue who does not speak to men and is speaking to a God exhort anybody? Comfort anybody? Oh my gosh. Can't edify, can't do nothing. Nothing at all. Look at verse 31. <laughs> this is good. First, all the way back to verse 31. Chapter 14, verse 31. Now, he, he's in the middle of one of these tests regarding these prophets. And he's using, he's using sarcasm right here. But anyway, 31. He says, for you can all prophesy. You can all prophesy. One by one. So that all may learn and all may be exhorted. Well, what is this prophesying? We'll look at verse 30. But if a revelation, revelation, revelation is made to one and to another who is seated, the first one must keep silent. Now, I, I, I'm really holding back the horse right here to not ex explain this. This is just, it's actually kind of funny, okay? But, but Paul's already established that not everybody is called to be a prophet. And then he says here in verse 31, for you can all prophesy. You can all prophesy. I'll just say this much to you. The idea behind this test is to out them, to make them look dumb, to make them look foolish so that they don't keep repeating this problem. But notice he says at the bottom of 31, so that all may learn and be exhorted. Now that truly is a benefit of being under the prophetic voice, a true prophetic voice. Now you, get, you can get that from Scripture, because Scripture is the true prophetic voice. Now, it's the perfect. The perfect has come. How wonderful it is. And you learn from it, do you not? You learn from Scripture. Do you get exhorted from it? Exhorted means to be pushed on, to, to carry on, to do a thing. Sure you do, all that kind of stuff. He says, for, back to verse 3, that the one who prophesies speaks to men for these three things. But you can't get that out of a tongue. I'm going to move, move you right to verse 4. But one who speaks in a tongue. See, he just won't get off this, will he? It must be an issue. We better pay attention. Why the heck has he got a singular going on here? Well, we've already seen that the singular is bad because he's expressed what's going on in verse 2 through the singular. When the singular is taking place, when Babel is taking place, you know, I, according to verse 2, I'm not speaking to man. Not speaking to man. Well, then, you're contra 12-7. You're contra 12-7. 
There is no common good there. If nobody understands. Verse 4. One who speaks in a tongue, a babble, edifies himself. It's selfish. Just make yourself feel good. It's mentally euphoric. You flip the switch inside. Uh, all of us who have been a part of, of, of that in the past are, are familiar with this. And you don't have to be experientially familiar you know, to understand what, what he's saying right here. I'm not suggesting that you learn how to flip your own switch or something like that uh, in any way, shape, or form. But it's selfish. But see, what the shame about it is that, man, and I learned a lot of good things when I was in Bible college. Going to Life Bible College, you know, Amy Semple McPherson, oh my gosh. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Pentecostal, classic Pentecostal Bible college. And, you know, there's a difference between classic Pentecost uh, and the charismatic uh, movement, especially the current third, and there's even a fourth wave right now, something else for, for another time. But I learned a lot of great things, a lot of, a lot of Bible, and uh, this was not one of them. This was not one of them right there, because then they would teach. Now, verse 4, you see, when you're praying in your private prayer language, you're building up yourself. You're edifying yourself. No, the edification is supposed to come for somebody else. 12, 7 again. Nobody ever pointed this out, but I wrote a paper and got in trouble over this paper because I was pointing this stuff out in regards to the whole tongue thing, right? And the, and the teacher, he said, Kelly, I'd like to talk to you. Oh, that hurts. <laughs> Can you stay behind? That hurts. Yeah, that, that hurts too, doesn't it? Can you stay behind? Hang on a second, Kelly. That hurts. Everybody else is leaving. You know, it's either going to be good or good. And he hands me this paper back, you know, and everything. And, and he says, so, so what do you believe? What is it? I, and I said, well, I, believe what I, I believe what I researched right here. No, 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 no. And he gave me a, he gave me a, a, a passing grade you know, on the paper, but the paper, I, mean, I thought it was better than a passing grade. Who cares? <laughs> he gave me this passing grade, but he didn't like it kind of a thing. Well, eventually, got to understand, eventually, I kind of uh, came around, you know, with, with everybody else because it's like when you're around all these people and the influence is there, you know, it's easier to go along with things. And I ended up being, you know, a four square uh, preacher, and you, you already know all, all about that. But here, one who, verse 4, who speaks in a tongue, edifies himself. Now, what's the other side? But one who prophesies edifies the church, builds up the church. Ah, so that is 12-7 working right there, isn't it? That is 12-7. It's for the common good. Verse 5, now, he says, I wish or I desire that you all spoke in what? Oh, there it is. There's the switch. There's the plural. He wants them all to speak in tongues. Now, Paul is not saying you can. Paul is not saying you can because, look, uh, verse uh, chapter 12, verse 29. I'm sorry. Yeah, I better start at 29. Chapter 12, verse 29. 12, 29. All are not apostles, are they? Implied answer is... No, all are not prophets, are they? No, all are not teachers, all are not workers of miracles. All do not have gifts of healings, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? So it's a matter of understanding that in verse 28, chapter 12, verse 28, that God has appointed in the church, appointed in the church, and then he lays down uh, the numerics right there in regards to that. Where's Rosemary? Feeling good. Not doing good? Okay. You want me to come over? Did you guys already pray today? Yeah, okay. keep up All right. All right. Honey, write down Rosemary's name for you and me. So when he says in verse 5, now I wish, I desire that you all spoke in tongues. He's talking about the true gift. He's talking about the miracle, 
the revelation gift. He's talking about all these different languages, which can be interpreted. But even more, even more, this is even more important. He says in verse 5, that you would prophesy. Even more, that you would prophesy. So he's back to this theme again. How wonderful this is. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to promote to you that of all the gifts, sans sans the revelation moment of prophesying that in the church today it is still the most important gift. It is still the declaration of God's word and God's will. It is still that which brings men and women and their hearts crawling to the cross. It is prophesying. It is speaking God's word that not only builds up the congregation and sets their feet on right doctrinal paths, but it must be promoted. It must be held up. We must be gathered together every chance we get to receive the prophetic word implanted inside of our spirits. It has to be that way or we will die. We'll just die. We'll shrivel up and that'll be the end of that. Or we fall back into worldliness, fall back into the things that just sort of get us by and just get me home so I can let that cable TV wash over me and I get up the next day and, and go to my job. No, no, you are members of the kingdom of God, members of the kingdom of Christ. And the kingdom is sustained through the health and healing and deep spiritual nutrition of prophesying uh, God's word. So I wish you all spoke in tongues. That'd be great. But even more, that you would prophesy. And greater is one who prophesies than one who speaks in tongues. True, true biblical languages. Unless he interprets. Now look at this last part so that the church may receive edifying. See, that just keeps coming back, doesn't it? Keeps coming back. Even in verse 6, But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking in tongues, what will I profit you unless I speak to you either by way of revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? So what will I, what will I profit you is the idea right there. Um, look down at verse 12. Verse 12. So also you, since you are zealous of Tanumatica, the spirituals, seek to abound for the edification of the church. And that's 12-7, 12-7, 12-7, again and again and again. Look down at 19, 19. However, in the church I desire to speak five words with my mind so that I may instruct others also rather than 10,000 words in a... What, what stands out here? Singular. Singular. I don't want to speak 10,000 babbly, babbly, babblies. I'd rather speak five words so I can instruct others also. Again, that lifts up 12-7. Verse 26, verse 26. What is the outcome then, brother? Or, or what is it, the Greek reads, but what is it like with you guys? There's your, there's your paraphrase. What are you guys doing, Okay. When you assemble, each one has a psalm. Each one has a teaching. Well, each one is not supposed to have a teaching. The teacher has the teaching. Has a revelation? No. Has a tongue? No. Has an interpretation? No. Let all things be done for edification. That's a nice way of saying stop doing these things where you all think you can sort of intermingle and you can all produce these things. No, there are offices that are set. That's why he says in 1228, God has appointed to themai, set in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then everything else after that, miracles, gifts of healings, and he goes on. Or our apostles, no! But these guys, what's it like when you guys, oh man, there's no edifying that's going on right here. No edifying that's going on right here. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, let's, let's bring an end to it by uh, me having you slip over to Deuteronomy 13. Deuteronomy 13.
And we'll do verse 1. Deuteronomy 13 and verse 1. Now, this is what I started out telling you at the beginning. This carries on. This is a principal, principal passage that carries on. Whenever God's word is spoken, whenever prophecy is spoken, this carries forward. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes true concerning which he spoke to you, saying, now watch, because the guy's not going to get in trouble for his little sign or his wonder. He's going to get in trouble for what's coming up next. Let us go after other gods whom you have not known. Let us serve them. What did we just read in 14.2? He who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to a god. See how it comes right over? This links. Three. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. You shall follow the Lord your God and fear him. I love my Jesus. I love my Father. And I fear him. I, 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 when I'm sitting and I'm saying things to you like, you know, this, this chapter 2, or verse 2, uh, is lacking the definite article in front of Theo. I am inside, I am shaking. I, I'm not just doing this. I'm not just, this is cool, you know. No. You shall follow the Lord your God and fear him. You shall keep his commandments. Listen to his voice. Serve him. Cling to him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be asked to leave the congregation and never botheth us again. No. That guy will be put to death. Why? Because he has counseled rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you out from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery to seduce you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk so you shall purge the evil from among you. Look at verse 10. Verse 10. So you shall stone him to death because he sought to seduce you from the Lord your God and and it goes on, and, and I won't take you to, to chapter 18. These are principles. You, know, you can point to this, and you can say, you know, thank God that the Lord Jesus, you know, Ephesians 2, 15 and 16 is, is fabulous for this, you know, that the enemy, which is the law, uh, which is given to us, you know, in commandments and other instructions, that this is our enemy and it has been dealt with. It has been, it has been dealt with, set aside by Christ, and, and we're not under that anymore. That includes things like this as well. You know, this is a social system situation in regards to how to deal with other religions. When you guys go into the land of Canaan and you start taking over, you know, this land, this is, this is the background to all of this. But you cannot escape the fact that this is God's heart coming out. You know, people, they, they, they especially worldly people, you know, they just, uh, they don't understand. Um, they can understand because they're natural. But they're like, well, there's a difference between the Old Testament God and the New Testament God. Old Testament God is big old giant meanie, you know, you know, big old bloody bat in his hand. He's going to kill everybody. But then over here you've got Jesus, tender Jesus, meek and mild, and, you know, that kind of a thing. It's just, it's just lame. These are people who don't read the Bible, don't study the Bible. They just, they, they can't. They're really not interested. But but, but in any case, you got this sort of an idea that's going on here. No, no, no. And it comes into the church. Listen, this is Jesus. You know, remember Isaiah 6? And Isaiah says, I saw the Lord seated high and, and all that. Well, according to John, John chapter 12, sorry, I had to remember. According to John chapter 12, John says, that was the Lord Jesus there. Jesus. 
in Isaiah 6. It wasn't, it wasn't Father. It was, it was the Lord Jesus. And then in John chapter 5, we've got the Father handing all authority for judgment over to the Son. Nobody judges except the Son. Right? But you've got this idea with Old Testament characters, just like in, in chapter 13, that this is just, this is just unreasonable. To, no, it's God's heart on this matter. God hates this sin. It looks to the words. He says this guy who is speaking prophetically is actually seducing you, leading you to another God. Joseph Smith was a, was a, a seducer. Charles Taze Russell uh, with the Watchtower Association, a seducer, see? And I mean, pick your guy. Anybody who changes who God is. I mean, I listen to Copeland. I listen to the old Hagen stuff like that. Seducers. They do not present the biblical God. I'll tell you, I'm going to be straight up with you right now, and then we're, we're, we're done. I think this is the best church in all of Omaha. I think it's the best church. You know why? It's the best church because you're getting, you're getting people who are teaching you and you who are receiving this word who are shaking about it. You're careful with it. You gotta be careful with it. And, and Carrie was just telling me the other day, it's like people don't like what you say. They, they don't want to hear this stuff. You know, um, and I'm not saying we stand out as like the greatest thing. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that there's a level of love, pursuing that love for Christ, combined with fear and a healthy respect for this is God's word. And at the same time, we have fun. We have fun. We do fun stuff, I guess. <laughs> I'm, I'm having fun right now <laughs> you know <laughs> so <laughs> what is uh, 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 it's Lord's Table next week huh uh, you guys alright maybe we can come that'd be great uh, in, in any case alright um, Revelation 19.10 says that it says that that the spirit of Christ really is the spirit of prophecy. It is Christ who is the spirit of prophecy. So when you handle this book, you are handling Christ and his mind thoroughly. So we need to be careful. All right, so Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, thank you, Lord, for... Thank you for strengthening me and enabling me to be with my brothers and sisters today, Lord God. Thank you, Father God, for the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace that is here uh, in this church. Thank you for the love of Christ that we share together, Lord. Thank you for the, the, the consistency. I look around at these folks, Lord. They've been here for years, many of them, Lord, and, uh, and I thank you so, so much uh, for that. Uh, Lord God, take these things that we've heard today. Take, the, take all that we've experienced in the, in the entire service, from the singing of psalms to the reading of thy word to the time of prayer and now the time of the, of the exposition of the word of God. Lord, we just give you thanks and praise for all that you're doing right here. Let our hearts continuously be open, Lord God, uh, not only to... Uh, the prophetic word made more perfect now, but to fearing that word, that we would not be people who treat your word in any kind uh, of an abrupt sort of fashion or a laissez fair sort of fashion, anything like that. May we be fully respectful of all that you are doing. And Lord, I pray for, I, I know that there's people in the congregation that need healing. And Lord God, I ask in the name of Jesus Christ that you would uh, use, Lord God, your gifts of healings according to your goodwill and good pleasure, Lord God. I see Jeremiah's got these crutches, Lord God, over here. And I just uh, believe with all my brothers and sisters right now, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that those ligaments come together, oh God. Bring these ligaments together, Lord. Cease all pain in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for that, Lord. Brother Brian, 
Dogen needs a, a continued touch, Lord, in regards to the diabetes situation. I know you have already touched him to a greater degree, but I ask that you would move even further in regards to him, Lord, and uh, sanctify and bless his house. They got a new place they're living in, Lord God. Bless that in the name of Jesus. I lift up Rosemarie, Lord God, and we are standing in agreement and in faith together, Lord, that you would heal her, lift her up, Lord God, restore her back to us, Lord God. We've just been experiencing these things. Rob, how are you doing? How are you? Have you been to the doctor yet? Not yet. Okay, see this? This is not going to the doctor. i just saying, bro. Huh. Okay, all right, all right. Father, in Jesus' name, I just love my brother Rob, Lord God, and we, we agree together, Lord God, with all of our love through Christ's name that you would just strengthen his heart, Lord God. Fill him afresh with thy spirit, O God. Encourage, lift him and Teresa and the Hamilton household up. Lift them up, Lord God, and strengthen them with all might by your spirit. Uh, in their inner man. Thank you for these things, oh Lord God. And I, I know there's others I'm missing right now, but we give you praise and glory. And right now, Lord God, we just want to we want to share our substance now uh, w uh, with uh, the congregation. We want to promote thy word and uh, thank you for all that you have given us now, uh, Lord, that we might share financially and otherwise um, uh, with the congregation, Lord, so that you are pleased that as we give May it be given unto us, O oh God. Good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Let man pour these things into our laps. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Go ahead, Frank.